Hey everybody, how's it going? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. Going to be doing one of these solo streams where I break down a piece. Now, normally when I'm doing this, I'm looking at some kind of article or video from a avowed leftist, somebody who explicitly is on the progressive side, on the left side, and we're breaking down their rhetoric, their frame, their use of language, the type of thing that dictates a lot of what goes on in our political discourse that sometimes people miss when they just dive directly into the argument and don't pay attention to the words, symbols, and general uh, frame around what's going on. But today we're going to do something a little different. We're going to be looking at someone who is theoretically right-wing. Of course, a lot of people are going to say, David French, man, come on. Everyone knows he's not right wing anymore. He hasn't been for a long time. If he ever was, he is writing for the New York Times. And all of that is fair, right? David French is now famous for the joking, you know, the conservative case for, right? Whatever horrific thing the left wing is suggesting. And that's where this title came from, of course. Uh, so a lot of people will say David French knows what he's doing. He's controlled opposition. He's entirely a creature of the left. And I understand why people would say that. However, I do want people to understand that it's always worth trying to grasp the idea that your political opponents might mean what they say, right? It's very easy to just say everyone is cynical, everyone is controlled opposition, everyone knows what they're doing, everyone is uh, just, just completely Machiavellian. But the truth is that almost everyone needs a moral justification for what they're doing. And it's not always the case that you have to have a perfect theory of mind for your political opponents, but it is often very useful because it allows you to make certain decisions, make certain arguments, understand what's going on. And so it is worth understanding, I think, the mind of someone who thinks of themselves as some kind of centrist conservative, some kind of principled conservative who's holding on to uh, to the idea of uh, neutral institutions and 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 kind of the neutral state uh they're they're just they're trying to avoid extremes of both sides of the culture war i do think it's worth taking a look at what they think because even if you think david french is acting in bad faith uh, i think he does represent a style of conservatism that still is out there the good news is that most people are walking away from this if you if you want a white pill for today if you want a a positive encouraging thing to take away from today i think there's a reason that guys like this uh end up now at the new york times because uh they're safe they're they're in many ways controlled uh they're they're really just apostates paraded before the liberal audience to put their own opinions into conservative language to make them feel better about it uh, but they don't really have a whole lot of sway on the Republican base. However, these people do still have a decent amount of control over the conservative incorporated apparatus, over the mainstream uh, conservative apparatus, uh, especially when it comes to people in the donor class. And so I do think it is worth looking at the way they think, even if we can kind of say it's obvious that there are problems with what's going on here. Now, I do want to say at the beginning, uh, I'm going to try to be as fair to David Fringe as possible in this, even though I don't think he's very fair to his opponents. I'm going to try to very, be very fair at the outset. And I will say that David Fringe has said that he opposes, in theory, uh, uh, gender reassignment for children. The, he, he does oppose that. However, as we're going to see in this piece, uh, it doesn't really look like that in any kind of practice. He does mouth the words that he opposes it, uh, but it looks like he doesn't oppose any action on its on behalf. Any he, he seems to oppose every kind of uh, protection that would be offered to children, any kind of restriction on this kind of horrific behavior. And so he he technically, theoretically opposes it. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna state that at the outset. I do not want to misrepresent or lie about the things that David French has said. He has said that he does uh, oppose this. However, what he's gonna say in here pretty much reads like the conservative case for trans kids. And we're gonna see all of the ways in which he's gonna justify uh, keep you know keeping the state out of the business of protecting children from this and and so we're let's go ahead and dive in and take a look here so uh, don't let the culture war degrade the constitution um too late for, first off and we'll see that's a lot of this piece is arguing uh horses that have already left the barn long ago but that is so often the case uh with conservatives who are still trying to cling to the idea that the constitutional order is 
uh, well in force and is actually restraining government action. Uh, it is not doing so. It hasn't done so for a long time. Uh, it doesn't do so specifically because people like David French actively oppose uh, the government taking the steps necessary to impose any kind of order. Uh, David French is one of these conservatives that believes that the Constitution just magically holds government power in check in perpetuity without any action uh, or any embodiment by the people of the nation uh, with the uh, values uh, that need to be transmitted through government institutions. Uh, and we're going to see that he kind of just opposes that for the conservative movement at every moment. But let's go ahead and dive in here. So the Constitution of the United States, properly interpreted, provides a marvelous method of handling social conflict. It empowers an elected government to enact even contentious new rules while protecting the most fundamental human rights of dissenting citizens. Political defeat is never total defeat. Losers of a given election still possess their basic civil liberties, and the combination of rights to speak and the right to vote provides them with concrete hope for their preferred political outcome. So as you can see here at the beginning, French is kind of just giving a very standard boiler, boilerplate idea of like what the Constitution is supposed to do, what liberal democracy is supposed to do. Now, we'll notice a couple problems here at the outset. So the first thing that French isn't going to really address is the fact that for the most part, the Constitution is supposed to do this inside a society uh, where people largely agree, where people largely share val values, where people largely share culture, and where most disagreements are relatively culturally mild, right? Th that's the when the Constitution is at its strongest, when it can kind of assume a background agreement on most issues of morality, most issues of value. Everyone has a general similar common viewpoint and really what the government is doing is enacting uh small policy changes and tweaks that could you know ha have a direction one way or another we're now existing in a reality where the difference is do we want people to have some kind of family do we want pe people to be able to have some kind of protection for children do we want people to have uh, a general christian understanding of morality or should people be allowed to mutilate their children if the child wakes up some time, you know, when they're eight or 10 or 12 and decides that maybe they want to be a girl tomorrow? That, that's a radically different type of value. This is, a, this is a vast gulf. And this is not to say there weren't disagreements previously, of course, in the United States, but this is a moral uh, basis. This is a conflict of moral visions that is just radically different on every level. Now, of course, there have been, there have been, conflicts in the united states that have been almost this radical con conflicting moral visions that have been this radical but democracy did not contain them right <laughs> like you look at the civil war now the civil war is obviously a very contentious issue because most people are going to identify it with slavery and that they're going to say one side was obviously morally correct and obviously morally wrong now i don't think that's historically accurate lincoln himself worked pretty hard to keep the civil war from being identified with slavery until he needed it to be identified with slavery in order to keep um, you know, European and other outside influences from recognizing the Confederacy uh, and contributing to or trading with the, the Confederacy. And so slavery was more of a political football uh, in many ways in, this, in the Civil War, though it obviously was an underlying cause, an underlying tension there for sure. You can't just ignore it. Uh, but the point is that no, no matter how you feel about whether Lincoln was or was not centering that as the the cause of the civil war the point is that that uh, situation was not mediated by democracy that this thing that was originally put in kind of the uh, you know in the broom closet by different agreements like the uh, you know three-fifths agreement in the constitution the three-fifths compromise in the constitution things like that that initially put those very contentious issues in the closet eventually could not contain them, right? Democracy could not actually control that issue. And over time, not just that issue, but the many, many differences in cultural values and cultural traditions between different regions of the United States became so vast and so unnegotiable that eventually democracy could no longer solve the problem. And so we're, we're looking at something that's not even necessarily true in American history, that, the, that this has not necessarily... Uh, regularly allowed one set of people to make vast changes 
to the American system. And another set of people who are radically disadvantaged by that will just eventually wait until they can get their turn at the democratic wheel. No, what we understand is that over time, people in charge trend, tend to build systems that allow them to uh, that allow them to manipulate the democratic process and ensure that they will continue to be the winners in any given contest. And people understand that at some point they've been backed into a corner by people who have decided to seize all of these different institutions and all these different processes in order to hedge themselves against any kind of actual uh, democratic uh, uh, backlash. And so we're going to see that French is just going to ignore this the entire time because it's, of course, in his interest to ignore the fact that this is a active part of democratic politics all the time, but a very active part of our system today, one that is ensuring a particular political outcome that French never wants to acknowledge, right? But if government both enacts contentious policies and diminishes the civil liberties of its current ideological opponents, then it sharply increases the stakes of political conflict. Well, that is absolutely true, right? If the government is, is enacting contentious policies and diminishing the civil liberties of its current ideological opponents, then it will increase the, uh, the stakes of the political conflict. The only problem is, again, this is happening right now, and this is not something that the right started, right? This is not something that the right started. If you lose an election, then you have a very serious chance that the opposing party will completely alter the way that voting happens or will completely open the borders, radically shifting the democratic demographic makeup of your country and shifting the voting of your country on purpose and that it's not a, it's not a conspiracy theory it's not a wild accusation you can literally just play like ma an hour of footage of leftists saying exactly that writing entire articles about exactly that about these different ways in which they are shifting the ability of their political opponents to properly engage with this we also know for a fact that places like the or that agencies like the fbi and the uh, Department of Homeland Security and other agencies inside the federal government actively work with uh, with private corporations to steer elections, to impact elections, to impact the information that is available to the public in order to sway a particular political outcome. So when you lose an election and you don't have any ability to regulate or staff those institutions, those institutions become filled with your enemies, and then your enemies ensure that you can't win elections. And so the political stakes are already incredibly high. But again, French is never going to mention any of this. He's, he's going to ignore this entirely. He's going to act as if the Constitution just operates all by itself. It's just it's hermetically sealed in some kind of time vault. Uh, no humans have to apply it. No shifting values, no shifting norms. Never going to acknowledge any of that always going to just be about the theoretical civil liberties that are existing out in the ether somewhere, no actual practical application in the real world. It breaks the social compact by rendering political losers in effect second-class citizens. And again, this is already happening. Okay. How many Bible believing Christians, how many people with traditional values can espouse those values at work without getting fired? especially if they're government employees. In fact, particularly for government employees, this isn't just, oh, it's a private company, it can have its own standards. No, if you espouse the viewpoint of a Bible-believing Christian or Orthodox Christian, you're going to get fired. You're going to get blacklisted. You're going to get, you can, you can possibly lose your ability to do things like a bank, right? That we've seen this happen to people. So pretending that there is not some incredible cost to losing elections already pretending that we already we don't already have a second class of citizens being created in the united states of people who have lost politically is ridiculous but of course he's going to pretend like none of this has already happened on the right we're just on the edge of this if the right fights back at all then this could happen right a culture war waged against the civil liberties of your political opponents inflicts a double injury uh, on dissenters they don't merely lose a vote, they also lose their share of freedom. Again, all of that is true, it's just that it already happened. This is not something that is being advanced by the right because it finally decided to fight back. What's happening is well downstream 
of many decades of this process of the left rewarding its friends and punishing its enemies at every opportunity. Every victory is a chance to reward its friends. Every victory is a chance to take something from its enemies. The left has been doing this for a very long time because they understand that this is what politics is about. But again, French is not going to ever acknowledge that during this. That's exactly what's happening now. The culture war is coming for American liberties and red and blue states alike. Of course, it's got to be both sides. We've got to do the old, the old both sides at every opportunity. Uh, the examples are legion. Let's start with America's progressive threshold, stronghold. Uh, now, he's going to talk about what the left is doing here. Um, I was going to skip through this, but again, I want to be fair to French. Uh, he is going to give both sides of this. He's going to chide the left a little bit here. Um, so we might as well go ahead and read it. Uh, it's not very long. He's going to spend most of his time attacking the right because, you know, this is what we do. Fig leaf of, ooh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a conservative. I'm against some of the things the left are doing. I'll put a whole paragraph in and then jump to, you know, uh, all the bad things that the right are doing. But, but we'll jump in here for a second and, and give him his due. Uh, on Wednesday, Governor Gavin Newsom announced that the state of California would not renew a multi-million dollar contract with Walgreens, not because Walgreens had failed to comply with its contractual obligation, rather because it had responded to Republican legal warnings and decided not to dispense an abortion pill in 21 red states. Newsom used his political power to punish a corporation he opposes. Weeks early, uh, yeah, so we'll we'll just stop there. So, uh, interesting, uh, you know, Newsom doesn't want to do business with Walgreens because it listened to Republicans, right? So he's publishing, he's, he's saying, we're not going to spend public money with a cor corporation that we don't agree with. Uh, I actually think that's up to him in this case. I disagree with him vehemently, of course, but uh, it is the public's money. And if they don't reflect the public values of California and you're for democracy, uh, then it's weird that you want the public's money spent with a corporation that they disagree with. Uh, I would be interesting, interested to see how David French feels about similar laws. There are some laws uh, like this, even in Florida, actually, with DeSantis, uh, when it comes to like Israel, right? Uh, against the boycott, divestment, uh, you know, movement, whatever. Uh, bit explicitly saying we don't do business with any business that doesn't do business with Israel. Um, I would be interested to see what David French feels about that. Maybe, maybe he's spoken out against it. Maybe he has to his credit. I, I genuinely don't know what his position is on that, but I would be interested, uh, if, if he's consistent across the different parties, uh, that would apply to a uh, week's earlier, a federal judge blocked enforcement of a new California law intended to combat medical disinformation, but case, because the state's definition of the term was so vague that it couldn't survive First Amendment scrutiny. This ruling came on the heels of multiple adverse rulings against California at the Supreme Court. In 2018, the court struck down California's rule requiring pro-life centers to publish information about free or low-cost abortions. During the pandemic, the court repeatedly rejected California public's health regulations that discriminated against religious worshipers. And in 2021, the court invalidated a mandatory donor disclosure law that violated court precedents that dates back to the civil rights era. So again, you know, credit to uh, French where he's due. He is talking about the excesses of the left here and the ways in which that the courts have pushed back. California is not alone in its efforts to suppress constitutionally protected rights. Late last month, the court appeals uh, for the, uh, the court of appeals for the second court held that New York's so-called boss bill, which prohibits employers from discriminating against uh, employees on the basis of their reproductive health, making decisions may violate the expression, uh, the expressive, uh, associational rights of pro-life organizations that require employees not to have abortions and to refrain from extramarital, extramarital sex. So again, uh, pushing back against the idea that a Christian organization could refuse to hire people who aren't Christians or who don't have Christian values, don't espouse Christian values. Uh, so again, you know, credit, credit to French where it's due. He is, uh, addressing the aspect of the left that they are uh, attacking the rights of people to practice religious selection of uh, association rights. Again, I've got a feeling that French isn't a huge fan of freedom of association in other areas, uh, but I, I don't know his um, his stance on that. I don't know that he's ever espoused in any particular direction, so I don't want to just go ahead and uh, guess at that right now. 
But no, I'm not letting Red America off the hook. Don't worry, David. We, we weren't under the impression that you would. Uh, the educational culture wars are inspi or inspiring a host of educational gag orders across the states that purport to block advocacy of disfavored ideas about race and gender. Uh, many of those statutes are aimed at K-12 through education, where the government has considerable control over teacher speech. But others are aimed at speech in public universities and private corporations, where states have much less control. Indeed, a federal court has already uh, blocked enforcement of Florida's so-called Woke Act to the extent that it limits free expression of public campuses and private boardrooms. So again, the K-12 through system, of course, is entirely under the purview of the state. The state de determines what's what the uh, curriculum is going to be, if not directly in each individual school district, district by its statewide standards, right? And so statewide standards are going to more or less dictate what you can say in a classroom, what you can teach in a classroom, what the agenda is going to be in a classroom, right? And what he's not going to address multiple times, again, this it's always what's not said here, right, is the fact that while he might want a scenario where teachers just teach whatever they want or professors teach whatever they want and students say whatever they want, that's already the scenario we don't have, right? It's not Florida's law that is making that not even the case. I mean, Florida's law literally only covers up to third grade when it comes to grooming. So by fourth grade, you can teach whatever gender ideology stuff garbage, right? It, it only covers K through third grade. If you cannot restrict yourself from going on and on ad nauseum about the need to explore your sexuality to a child, then you really shouldn't be anywhere near children and you should probably be behind bars, right? If, if that's so desperately important to you, then society should really probably be watching out, you know, for, for where you're at in general, right? But the point that David's always going to ignore is that the things that teachers teach are not dictated just by uh, some state law, right? It's the the standards that are already created by the state are going to restrict what teachers can say. The curriculums that are delivered, the materials, the books, the worksheets, the videos, all that stuff is already going to have a particular outlook in it, right? And then when you look at something like what is taught to, to teachers themselves, what educational uh, programs in different universities impress upon teachers. It's all radically left wing. It's all radically left wing guys. And, and I can tell you this because I taught, I, I know, I know what's going on here. All of this stuff, even in super conservative States like Florida is radically left wing. Okay. And so the, even, even these States that have these restrictions are still teaching an incredibly woke curriculum. Uh, and, and, it, French is never going to acknowledge this, right? There are plenty of things already that as a teacher, you cannot teach and you cannot say because they will get you fired. And that has nothing to do with the wokeness act, the stop woke act, right? If you're in a high school, even in a very right wing state, are you even allowed to teach the idea that maybe the civil war wasn't primarily about slavery? You might get away with that one a little bit. But when you get to all kinds of other topics in the curriculum, there's one acceptable narrative, right? Is anyone, is anyone teaching a high school class in, even in the most right-wing state in the United States in a public school where they teach that say, you know, the crusades were defensive wars by, by, by Christendom against Islamic aggression. Can you teach that? Will you, will you survive as an employee of the state if you teach that? If you, if you teach that the Spanish recon, uh, Reconquista was a battle against, I don't know, the vast sexual slavery practiced by the Muslims of Al-Andalus, is that a narrative you're allowed to espouse even in, a right, in the most right-wing uh, state in the union, right? Are you allowed to provide any context for these things? No, right? But again, French is gonna avoid all of this, right? Maybe mostly because he probably agrees with all the narratives taught in public schools by leftists, right? 
And that's the thing is that they're always going to ignore what's already baked in. They're already going to ignore what's baked in, right? They're already going to ignore the fact that people, uh, are, are basically forced to teach, uh, a very left-wing agenda, even in the most right-wing school. And they're only going to address, it's only the formalization of restriction that will trigger French, the, the, the private sector for French can do anything. And even if the private sector in this case means like public universities, right? The, 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 they're not private, but it doesn't matter. He says the state has no interest in saying, Hey, we don't want like lies taught to kids. We don't let, want things that destroy the identity of children that destroy the innocence of children. We don't want that taught to kids. He's going to say, that's not okay. That's curtailing the free speech of teachers, but the teachers don't have free speech. They don't have it at all. All right. Florida is one of the hot spots of right-wing censorship and punitive government. It passed an unconstitutional law to control social media moderation in, uh, in the state and governor Ron DeSantis took direct action against Disney after the uh, company, uh, objected to Florida's house bill 1557, which tightly regulated classroom instruction on sexual orientation or gender identity. So a couple things here, a couple things that again, we're going to, we're not just not going to acknowledge in this argument at all. First, if you click on this link, <laughs> this, it passed an unconstitutional law link. What you'll find is that that law stopped social media companies from banning politicians. So the law that he's talking about that is theoretically unconstitutional is a law that kept social media companies from banning politicians that they don't like that stopped politicians from using free speech to reach their voters with their message now david french is supposed to be such a huge proponent of the democratic process right he's got so much faith in the ability of the democratic process to restrain the excesses of the government and the and and the wider culture except he doesn't like any protection of that speech he's not willing to acknowledge that private corporations have a vast control over the ability of representatives to actually reach their voters and actually change what's going on and so when he says this unconstitutional law on social media moderation what he's saying is florida tried to make sure that people can hear their elected representatives and communicate with them and that the democratic process which french reveres so highly can go on as it's supposed to but again no preser only the formalization of protections are the problem for french he's never willing to address the actual attacks of people like social media on the democratic process which he reveres so highly and again you notice he's not going to say anything here about the fact that he knows that we know for sure we have the twitter files we don't have to speculate it's not a wild conspiracy theory he knows that social media companies these private corporations are working hand in glove with the intelligence community with uh, federal law enforcement to punish american citizens and american politicians for their viewpoints, to censor them, to stop what they label misinformation. He knows this, right? But we're, again, we're just going to get a quick link and just, oh, it's unconstitutional. And he just moves on as if there's no problem here, right? So then we move on to Disney, right? Uh, it, it, if the right is going to condemn Newsom's action against Walgreens, shouldn't it also oppose DeSantis's attack on Disney? No, here's why, okay? He's going to ignore all the particulars about what Disney did here. He's going to ignore all the details about what actually happened in the scenario. Oh, one corporation was, was, uh, disfavored. Another corporation was disfavored, disfavored. Same thing. No, they're not. No, they're not at all. So what did Disney do here? Uh, first, actually at first Disney didn't do anything <laughs> at first. Disney did not care about this bill. Okay. But what happened What the left is so good at and what French is of course going to ignore entirely is the ability of the left to use the manipulation of voters and the manipulation of media and the manipulation of activists in order to drive particular concerns. 
So what happened with this is the left went out there and it riled up all these accusations against Disney. Oh, you don't care about LGBT people. You don't care about what's hacking. You care more about your profits than you care about the rights of whoever. And they said you and they said you have to get involved in this. And so Disney, which hadn't take any, taken any particular stance against what Florida was doing, was suddenly spurred by activists to take action, not just by activists outside the company, but activists inside the company. The bureaucracy in Disney, the professional managerial class that had been filled with activists through woke HR and such, suddenly turned against the company and said, you need to take action during this. And so Disney faced a, Disney's board, Disney's leadership, faced a revolt both externally from activists and internally from employee activists saying, you have to actually do something about this. But again, we're going to omit all, omit all of this. And what did Disney do? Well, Disney said, no, we have the right in Florida to go ahead and indoctrinate children. And the, and the best thing is Disney held all these public struggle sessions, right? And we have links to a lot of this. I believe Chris Rufo and others were directly involved in getting us access to what Disney was saying about this. And what did Disney say about this? Well, they explicitly brought in different employees who said, oh, no, we're totally on board and these are their words not mine you know the, no no ja, ja, uh, jack uh, chick track could have uh you know kind of predicted this better right but they had employees specifically saying things like oh yeah i'm definitely implementing my not so secret gay agenda in my children's programming and florida would push against that and so we don't like this right so agenda so what all that happened during this was uh disney just outed the incredible bias and the incredible amount of indoctrination that its employees and those committed uh, to this uh, to this agenda inside their own corporation were pushing, right? And so he's going to ignore all of this. He's going to ignore all of the context for this. But here's the most important part. Here's the thing that's really infuriating about what French is doing. He's also ignoring the fact that Disney was given specific privileges, right? It's not that Ron DeSantis went out and got the Florida legislature to start, you know, leveling punitive taxes against Disney or, or uh, you know, putting specific restrictions just on Disney. Hey, we hate Disney. It's not that Ron DeSantis was, was locking up Mickey Mouse performers or dragging away, uh, you know, different cast members at Disney. Uh, none of this was what happened. What, what was the, the horrible thing that Florida was going to do to Disney? It's going to make Disney play by some of the rules. Still not all of it. Disney still has many of the privileges it enjoyed before all of this. But they went in and they said, yeah, okay, so Disney currently has its own special, basically, municipal district. And the special municipal district for Disney allows it to uh, circumvent most of the, like, permitting and taxes and other requirements that are placed on most corporations and businesses inside of Florida. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take your, basically, your tiny little fiefdom, your tiny little independent kingdom, your Vatican City in the middle of Florida, and we're going to say, no, this one corporation doesn't get to live like it's its own king, like 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 old school uh, company town where it just gets to own the police and own the firefighters and own every aspect of the municipality around it. We're going to we're going to get rid of some of that exemption. And by the way, they still have most of it. So it probably didn't even go far enough. But the point is that all they did was remove Disney's special privileges. Now, French is a principled conservatism, right? He, or, sorry, he's a principled conservative, right? So he should be against special privileges for corporations, evil play, or equal playing field, right? Free market. But he doesn't acknowledge any of that. He doesn't acknowledge the fact that Disney was living like a king with its own special little uh, fiefdom inside of Florida, and all that happened is the special privileges got stripped away because it attacked the people who had extended them. Now, he would say, oh, that's punitive politics. Well, yeah, guess what? If you attack people who are giving you special, specific uh, privileges that it's not giving to anyone else, you might lose them. And you, as a conservative, should celebrate that because you're supposed to be for the free market and you're supposed to be for equal treatment. And yet, Nothing, right? No mention of that. It's just the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. No context, no explanation of what actually happened in that scenario. It's just treated as exactly the same thing. It's a sign of our times that the list, uh, that the list above from the left and the right is woefully incomplete. 
careful observers will be able to point to any number of additional culture war motivated statutes and regulations and government actions that take aim of the, at the Bill of Rights. And of course, there will be many here, as we'll see. Uh, state, uh, state attacks on civil liberties are even affecting our most valuable relationships, the bond between parent and child. In January, the Times reported on how public schools sometimes withhold from uh, parents information about a child's gender transition, even in the absence of any evidence of parental abuse. So this is really important. This happens all the time. This is standard operating procedure. And again, I can tell you that because this happened in the school I was teaching in, in Florida, before this passed. The standard uh, application from that school district was we uh, that, that was pushed down from the state as i understood it is that uh you don't tell parents about gen their their children gender transitioning you're not allowed to you lose your job if you do so you're re you're required to lie to parents to keep their job now thank god i was never put in that position i didn't have to make that choice between keeping my job and telling the parent a truth the truth about what's going on with the kid because i would have gotten fired right but one of the reasons I'm really passionate about this stuff is I've been in this position. I know this is what goes on. I know this is what happens. I know this is what policy, even again, in the most right-wing theoretically states here. People are put in a position where they either lie to parents about things that are incredibly dangerous and destructive to the lives of their children, or they get fired, right? So, this is absolutely something that has to be opposed. And it's good, you know, good again for French for acknowledging that this is a very serious problem. But the problem is that French is not going to attack any things around this, any of the things that led to this, right? He's going to treat this as one point, one instance that just whoopsie daisy happened to happen out of this. But of course, this is an outgrowth of a system. This is not just one isolated incident, as we can see over and over again. And he's just never going to address any of the private institutions or cultural driving forces he's only ever going to point to the formalized restrictions in some of these instances california has enacted a statute that grants the state a, br a broad authority to permit ch uh, children to receive gender affirming health care there even potentially over the objection of a custodial parent again yeah that is absolutely insane right you can just take your child to um you can just take your child or the or child can just flee to California and the parent loses rights, right? Or if the child's already in California, they lose rights, basically turning into a sanctuary state for child mutilation, right? This is, and we already know that this is happening. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember the gentleman's name. Sorry, it's, it's escaping me uh, live here. But there's that one gentleman whose son, you know, was, was uh, the, the mother wants the son to transition and took the child to California, basically terminating the rights of the father to protect their child from this type of abuse. Because once they're in California, yes, Jeff Younger, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I, I just uh, spaced on it for a second there. But yeah, Jeff Younger, right? Like the, the child's taken to California and all of a sudden, uh, what was already a very contentious issue in Texas, you know, shame on Texas for not securing the rights of, of Jeff Younger uh, uh, much earlier uh, and the right to protect that child. Uh, but now that the the uh, the ex-wife has fled to California, there's just no no ability to protect the child at all, which is just horrific. For example, Section Seven of the law states that California courts won't weigh uh, as a factor against a petition seeking California uh, seeking California court extra uh, jurisdiction if the person took a child fr uh, from the person who has legal custody in order to obtain gender affirming care. So basically, you can just steal the kid <laughs> from. From uh, the person who should have authority over them, and uh, and the California court doesn't care, uh, and uh, and that care is limited by the law or policy of another state, and because every culture war action against civil liberties has its own mirror image on the other side, and here we go, right? Both sides, horseshoe, you know, I'm in the middle, I'm I'm principled, you know, uh, governor uh, of Texas, uh, Greg Abbott, uh, governor of Texas, issued a directive to the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services to investigate as abuse, both surgical and pharmaceutical interventions for uh, transgender children. Here's the, here's the terrifying part. Here's, here's where David French is playing with the conservative case for trans kids. Regardless of the good faith and desires 
of the parents and children and caregivers involved. David, where's the good faith here? How is this good faith? In what good faith scenario does a parent assent to the mutilation of their child? In what good faith scenario does a parent say yes to a procedure that could chemically castrate their children because the kid saw something on TV or had it pushed on them by a teacher? How is that good faith? And how does the desire of parents and children play into this when it comes to actually mutilating children? Can the, can the child consent, David? Is that what you're saying? The consent of the child is what matters here? That's a really interesting thing to be asserting that the child can consent to this. Or, the, or if you get the child and the parent's consent, then it's fine, right? That then it's okay, right? You'll notice that every part of this is just steeped deeply in leftist ideology. David is using the words of the left in every way, at every step, both surgical and pharmaceutical intervention for transgender children. Uh, first, what does that mean? Why are you using this language? Why are you using their left language here? I'm not really sure what I can say on YouTube here, so I'm doing my best <laughs> to not use the new speak but also, you know, not, not get the stream nuked from orbit. But um, when you say interventions here, what do you mean? And why are you acknowledging that this is something legitimate? Why are you legitimating the left's uh, associations here? Unless you agree with them. Unless you think they are legitimate. Unless, of course, you plan to later on agree with this stuff. And you get a feeling that's exactly what is going to end up happening because it already has. French already did this with gay marriage. He opposed it until he said he was for it or not that he was for it to again, be fair to French. What he said was basically I'm still for the Christian definition when it comes to religious marriage, but basically for us all to live together, we have to have the leftist definition of civil marriage. And you'll see this over and over again. David's commitment is not to his conservative values. David's commitment is not to his Christian values. David's golden calf is the Constitution, and, or at least his construction of the Constitution, which I don't think is accurate, okay? I'm sorry, but I don't think that James Madison <laughs> or Alexander Hamilton or John Jay or any of the people who contributed to the Bill of Rights were attempting to enshrine the right of, of a parent to carve, to pay someone to carve functioning organs off of their child. Sorry, I don't think that was the intention. I'm pretty sure if they found out that was happening in their neck of the woods, <laughs> um, things would happen. Again, I'm just going to be careful with YouTube here, but I'm pretty sure that they would have taken action to protect that child <laughs> from from this. I don't think they would have imagined that there should be a, that the constitution allowed for a, a movement that would force this onto children and would facilitate the right of surgeons and parents to make this happen on behalf of a child, right? And also, I would like to go ahead and acknowledge at this point, something that David's not going to acknowledge, that this entire thing is held up, these interventions, as David calls them, are entirely facilitated by a complex of public-private partnerships through healthcare, uh, the healthcare industry, right? Most of the kids undergoing this, most of the parents who are agreeing to it, would not do so if insurance companies weren't basically funding this stuff, weren't turning these kids into eternal uh, patients eternal wards of both the state and the medical industry, right? If they were, if, if the insurance industry was not directly funding and facilitating this, most of these people, the vast majority of them would never have the ability to do this. So this is being funded through public private partnerships. This is being enabled through public pri private partnerships, right? This is all a artificial scaffolding created to ensure this outcome. But again, 
French isn't going to acknowledge any of this. It's, you know, private corporations, you know, parents, parents can do what they want. Oh, really, David? What you, you, you okay with child abuse? You think, you think that if, if the parents okay with it, that's fine. You don't think the state has a role to protect children. You think that the parents should be able to go ahead and expose the child to any and everything they want at any time. I got a feeling you don't right. Yes. We do want autonomy for families. We don't want the state to be involved in every interaction between child and parent. hundred percent. I'm biggest advocate of that, but we all understand that there are lines. We all understand there are things that the, that the parent is not allowed to do that. We as a society do not approve of the left is more than clear on that. And as we can see from an increasingly uh, sad number of cases, the left will actively remove the ability of the parent to have authority over their child if the, if the parent disagrees with gender ideology. But again, this is where David's going to spend his time. To understand the gravity of the state interfering with the parental authority, it's worth remembering that the words of Chief Justice Warren Berger in 1972 case Wisconsin versus Yoder, in which he wrote that the primary role of parents is in the upbringing of their children is uh, now established beyond debate as an enduring American tradition. To simply presume that parents are abusive because they may dissent from state consensus on transgender care is to violate their this principle of the of American law. Well, again, what are you talking about? What does dissent from consensus mean here? Because you're right. Parents should have the ability to dissent from consensus in many different areas. I'm with you there. I think this, I think that the state should stay out of the family sphere as much as possible. But let's get really, really specific. Let's not sugarcoat, or as specific again as we can on YouTube, let's not sugarcoat what you mean when you say, uh, pharmaceutical and surgical intervention. That's a really clean bit of language, David. What do you mean by that? What are you really saying? What's getting removed? What actions are being taken by that surgical intervention? What permanent damage is being caused? How desperate are you making that child? How dependent are you making that child on the adoption of this transgender identity, identity and the irreversible nature of so many of the physical changes and direct mutilation that you are inflicting on this. The practice is barbaric. The practice is barbaric. Okay. And pretending that this is just, Oh, it's as some little dissent, you know, it's so, some, some little difference. No, no, this is a horrific violation of the innocence of children who have been preyed upon by the forces that you will not protect them from. You will not protect them from the media forces. You will not protect them from the social media. You will not protect them from an educational apparatus, all designed to drive them towards this inevitable conclusion. And then when it comes time to make the irreversible physical deformation of these children, a permanent thing funded at every step by this massive oligarchy, driving them towards this outcome, you won't protect them then either. Because if the, if the, parent can be shamed into assenting to this. If the parent can be beaten into assenting to this, then it's fine. It's just a blessing of Liberty enshrined in the constitution, just the way that the founding fathers meant to it to be. I'm sure this is exactly the outcome they were looking for in a nation. Uh, let me make sure I got the rest of this here. Yeah. Okay. In a nation as diverse as the United States conflicts over values are inevitable, but our most basic civil liberties must remain inviolate again here's the problem david that's a value that's a value and this is an issue this is a huge issue for many conservatives but especially for kind of the principled conservative con inc crowd right they will not acknowledge they will not acknowledge that there is no like superseding value in the united states that everyone shares at this point to civil liberties. It doesn't exist. Okay. It doesn't exist. And pretending it does puts you in a terrible situation because you're ignoring that the very conflict of values is what is already degenerating the civil liberties that politicians are already using those powers to restrict and destroy the civil liberties and ensure that they stay in power. 
has David French talked about the destruction of democracy via uh, via open borders? Is David French fighting back v- vehemently against the complete destruction of the voting apparatus through mail-in ballots and absentee ballots? No, right? We're not. We're not getting columns on this. Maybe he does. Maybe he has a whole library of them. I haven't seen them, but maybe he does. To be fair, maybe maybe that's a huge issue for him. But I don't seem to see that. It doesn't seem to be the case. It seems to, it seems to be his biggest. Uh, he's not in here praising Ron DeSantis for cleaning up mail-in ballots and getting same-day voting done. He's not doing that, right? He's only here to attack Ron DeSantis for trying to protect kids. And he can say, oh, I'm, I'm against this. At the end of the day, I'm against transition for children. He can say that, oh, in my private life, I would never do that to his kid. Let's hope, right? Of course, I think probably all of David French's kids are, are grown at this point, but you, you get my understanding here. He might say, yeah, in my private life, this is the old, the old conservative. Well, in my private life, I'm, I'm against this, but I don't think the state should get involved. Well, the state's getting involved. The state's already getting involved. The state's already involved. It's already here. So now what do you do? But again, that we're not allowed to acknowledge that reality because acknowledging that these are two competing value systems that cannot coexist, that cannot be mediated by some overarching commitment to civil liberties would, would mean that David French has to do something would mean, would mean that conservatives have to take action and that's something that cannot be acknowledged. To govern otherwise both inflicts a grave injury on dissenting citizens and violates the letter and spirit of the Constitution itself. Great. So how are dissenting citizens doing in the United States? How about Douglas Mackey? How's Douglas Mackey doing? He allegedly made a meme and they're trying to throw him in jail. Right? Because he made a meme. The same kind of meme that leftists were making and faced no penalty for. What about protesters? BLM protesters, Antifa protesters, rioters can inflict all kinds of violence and death on the country for months on end and face no penalty. But actual political dissenters on January 6th, they don't get to see their families. They're, they're, the, the necessary footage to help them in their trial is denied to their attorneys, right? But, you know, those, I guess that just doesn't matter, right? That, that's not what we're focused on. The most important thing is that you can teach gender ideology to a first grader, to a kindergartner. The most important thing is that if a child consents and a parent has been bullied into it, you can go ahead and do irreversible physical damage to a minor. It's just not a concern for David. He, he can't, can't. It's not a big deal, right? He can't acknowledge that the civil liberties are already being destroyed, that this framework is already in tatters, because that would give up the game. Our right to speak, much less to parent, should not be contingent on our ability to gain political control. Sure, okay, great, but it is, so now what? Right? So now what? Because social media companies are already working with the federal government to limit your speech. But you don't want Florida to have the ability or Texas to have the ability to stop them. You don't want the democratic process to work. You don't want that. Not that I think it would have worked anyway, <laughs> but, but, you, but you explicitly are out there talking about the importance of maintaining the constitutional order and allowing the consequences of democracy to be what shifts the tides of cultural and political change in the United States, but just never going to acknowledge the fact that that already doesn't happen, that the system is already manipulated in a way that makes that impossible. Right. But we're just never going to acknowledge that is we're going to pretend like Ron DeSantis and Greg Abbott are the first movers here. Just insane. Uh, the much better course uh, for our democracy is to uphold a legal corollary to the golden rule, defend the rights of others, that you would like to exercise yourself. It doesn't end the culture war. Uh, yeah, except again, not happening, right? It's, it's actively not happening now. We'll still clash over contentious issues, but maintain a bedrock defense of civil liberties, uh, 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 or maintaining a bedrock 
Defense of civil liberties lowers the stakes. Again, that's a nice thing in theory, but it's not what's happening in practice. What's happening in practice is that losing an election means that your political opponent runs roughshod over your ability to impact the democratic process, specifically through the actions of private corporations that David would defend, that David would say should have the ability to ban politicians, should have the ability to censor information, should have the ability to shut down the very key lifeblood to the democratic process he reveres. He's going to ignore all of that. He's not going to say anything about it. Private companies should be able to do all of those things at the behest of the political victors. He's not going to acknowledge any moment of that. He's just saying, well, if Ron DeSantis tries to, to take any kind of action to protect the citizens of his state, if Greg Abbott takes any kind of protection to try to, to or any kind of action to protect the citizens of his state from the very thing that will destroy their ability to participate in the democratic process, then they're the ones who are violating the constitution and accelerating the culture war. The culture war is already accelerated. David, David wants to turn down the temperature on a pot that is already boiled over and is scalding everyone. And he just wants to ignore it. Protecting individual freedoms tells all Americans and all American families that the social compact holds. It doesn't hold. That's the problem. That's what can't be acknowledged. It doesn't hold. It has not held. I wish it had. I really would. But it didn't. So what do we do now? Win or lose on any given issue, regardless of how controversial this country is still their home, except that's actually what everyone, especially people who disagree with David French, are being told is not the case. You don't belong here. You aren't American. This isn't what America is. That's what they're hearing from their representatives. That's what they're hearing from their media. They're being told, you can be replaced. You're not valuable. In fact, the people who will come here to take, <laughs> you know, they will be way better Americans than you. That's what people are told. That you, some, some conservative in a red state, you're worthless. You, you're a drain on the economy. You're, you know, you're, you're uh, dragging everything down. And this is not your home anymore. You're, you're, you're a relic of the past. Your values are out of date. They're not insured this. They're not, the system is not protecting them. And they know it. And pretending that we live in some kind of fantasy land where the Constitution has protected all of these things and none of these things are issues is just deeply disingenuous. And yeah, it helps you hold on to your idealistic worldview about what actions conservatives should take and the role of the government should be. But it completely ignores the actual well-being of the people you're supposed to, in theory, protect. But of course, David French isn't supposed to protect them. David French is paid at this point to attack them. And while I think he probably does, you know, theory of mind of our opponents here, I think he does genuinely believe he's doing the right thing. He thinks he really is standing up for the lost, you know, uh, legacy of conservatism that will shepherd things through. At the end of the day, he's profiting over the destruction of the very culture that he is in theory supposed to protect. And he's incentivized to continue to do so. He's already shifted his positions. He'll continue to shift them because that's where the power is. This somehow this principle conservatism always finds a way to bend the knee to the next left wing crusade just in time. And it'll happen. Right, we we do. If you didn't catch it today, on Twitter, our illustrious Grand Admiral, our our, our Trans Admiral of Healthcare in the United States, announced that um, transition for minors is gonna the wheels gonna turn on this. You know that you an election or two, this will just be normalized, right? And this is exactly what I warned about. What other and I wasn't alone. Many people, you know, saw this one coming. Uh, thank goodness. Uh, and many people warned about it, but we were all told that's crazy. That's insane. It isn't happening. Don't be ridiculous. Right. But we see the celebrate, the celebration parallax, Michael Anton's celebration parallax advance, right? First stage, it's not happening. Then, okay. It, 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 you know, it's not really happening in very many places, but if it did, then it wouldn't be so bad. Okay. Yes, it is happening, but, but only in, in some places. And then finally, okay. Yeah, it was always happening and it's really good. There was, it was actually a key part of this. 
And so what we're seeing now is the left is moving from its uh, accusation or its, its assertion that none of this is happening. This isn't happening to minors. This is never going to put pushed on kids. The kids aren't being groomed into this. And they're now not so slowly and not so subtly shifting their position to, of course, this was being pushed on children. It has to be pushed on children. This is the moral, moral arc of history. It was always going to go this direction. It had to go this direction. And if it didn't go in this direction, that would have been a horrific human rights violation, right? We're seeing that Joe Biden did that interview. I did that, that piece yesterday, a uh, video on uh, Joe Biden's interview with The Daily Show, where he says, Florida, Florida, you know, Ron DeSantis defending children from gender transition is a sin. That was his, his word. It's a sin, right? And then he said, what, and then, you know, because he's, he's just, you know, verbally incontinent, uh, he then blurted out the the left's plan, which was going to be their plan all along. We're going to go ahead and get rid of the rights of states to protect children. And we're going to go ahead and get in there. And he said they're going to do it through legislation, but they're not. They're going to do it through the courts first. And we're going to destroy the ability of places like Florida and Georgia to, to protect children against this horrific and barbaric practice. That is the plan of the left. That is where this is going. And all your talk about civil liberties and separation. You know, this, this piece was dropped one day before the joe biden interview where biden basically said uh, actually i'm going to ignore, ignore all the dictates of like federalism and everything and i'm just going to go in and bulldoze this stuff and make this the law of the land but i got a feeling david french isn't going to have much to say about that or maybe he will maybe maybe he'll have the courage of his convictions on that but i've got a feeling he won't and those in power those in the biden administration are more than happy to tell anyone who will listen from their trans admiral all the way up to the president of the united states that they're totally backing this, they're totally on board with this, and they're more than willing to use every aspect of the federal government and its public-private partnerships, which will work around the Constitution and the First Amendment and subvert everything that David Trench pretends to care about and protect. They're going to do all this stuff. This is their agenda. It's stated. It's declared. And the question is, will you be willing to use the power of the state in the states where you have it, like Florida or Texas, to protect these kids? And the answer from David French is, no. And that's horrific. Uh, but let's go ahead and take a look here at our super chats real quick. Looks like we stacked up quite a bit. Let me grab those. Uh, let's see. Uh, Creeper weirdo for $5. New phrase for right wingers. Don't be French. How does that sound? I think that is always been true of, uh, of right wingers. I think, uh, there's a healthy, a healthy tradition of making fun of the French on the American, uh, right. And will probably continue, continue to be the case. Uh, though I gotta be honest, uh, you know, if America keeps going this way, we might be the ones that are the, the ones joked about if you know, we aren't already, uh, Creeper weirdo again for $2, but national review says, yes, uh, our friends at national review are always letting us know. Actually, to be fair, there, there's a couple of people over there, you know, Nate Hockman from the national review, who's been on the show a couple of times. Uh, he's very good on this. I've, I've had him on specifically on this topic, uh, multiple times. Uh, so while I will, uh, I will hundred percent say that the national review is, uh, an institution that, uh, desperately in a desperate way, uh, and is hopefully on its way out. There are some people there doing good work. Guys like Nate are, are doing good work. Uh, creeper weirdo here again for $2. I will not fed post. I will not fed post much appreciated. Uh, your restraint is essential. Uh, really appreciate that glow in the dark here for $10. Good faith by David French's estimation is based on liberalist lawyer or bureaucratic view based on these policies or rulings. Uh, it's completely fine with trans kids. Pluralism is the mantra. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, again, there's no principle. There's no principle that David French is not willing to violate in service to his highest principle, which is this idea of constitutional plurality. And so there's, there's nothing that he won't let be done. <laughs> there's no, there's no, there's no destruction of well-being. He will not let happen as long as he thinks it falls under these, these proper procedures. And that's what conservatives were lulled into so many times, so many times conservatives were lulled into this idea that it's okay for horrific things to happen for the left to implement all kinds of horrific policies to victimize all kinds of people. As long as all the procedures were followed, as long as all the rules are followed, that's all that really matters. We got to follow the rules. And so you're exactly right. Go in the dark that as long as the, the liberalist ideas, as long as the bureaucratic process was followed, that's all that matters. Now, French is again, never going to address 
how the bureaucracy comes to its decisions. How are medical experts, people who are supposed to be super familiar with biological reality and the ethics implied by doing irreversible damage to children, how are they at the forefront of pushing this stuff? Hmm? But he's never going to address that, right? Because it's, it's, it's not a civil liberties issue in his, his eyes. All that matters is the process. All that matters is the bureaucracy. Never addressing the underlying, uh, underlying cause moving this. Never acknowledging the fact that the government is actively taking a role in incentivizing these theoretically private actors to have these outcomes. Never going to acknowledge that. Always about making sure we pay attention to procedure. Good news, again, if you want to take one white pill away from this today, because I know it's a, it's a very uh, enraging topic in many ways. It can, it can be, you know, a, it can be a little bit of a downer uh, to talk about. Uh, one thing you should take away from this is the good news is the irrelevance of people like David French. At this point, David French's audience is the left. David French is an apostate of the right who goes around and puts the 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 message of the left into the words of Christian conservatives so the left can feel like this is what real Christian conservatives would believe. They want to believe that somewhere out there, there's like a, a, a Republican party that can be reconstructed of David French's so they can keep this dance of, of, of pretending there's two sides to American politics alive. But increasingly it's very clear that that's not the case, right? It's increasingly clear that that's not the case. Uh, that that the right is abandoning the positions of David French, that he doesn't have the kind of authority or leadership that uh, the left would like to pretend he does. And that's the good news, is that more and more people on the right are ignoring that or are ignoring the, 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 uh, the ideas of David French. He's not making a case that is particularly compelling to most conservatives today. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ronald McNuggets here. Um, I, I'm not sure what denomination that is. Is that South Korean? Uh, but anyway, thank you very much. Uh, David's golden calf is not the Constitution, but keeping the New York uh, Stock Exchange open and LLCs filing uh, for D, uh, DA billionaires. Uh, side on why uh, 1964 Act is illegal. Uh, what speech does uh, hostile work environment harassment law restrict? Uh, Professor Eugene Volks. Okay, I'm not sure about all of those references there. It looks like there's a reference as to uh, a legal reference from a legal uh, from a professor on uh, why the 64 Civil Rights Act violates certain aspects of the Constitution. Uh, I'll say this, uh, Ronald. I think that uh, David probably does revere the Constitution, um, at least again his construction of it. Uh, I do want to give. Uh, it's, it's again easy to cynically say all of my enemies are bought off and none of them. Uh, uh, have any kind of conviction. I don't think that's true in the case of David French. Um, uh, I do think he is motivated. Uh, I do think there are incentives lined up for him to continue to do this kind of uh, apostate uh, dance for the left. But I do think he probably uh, does value the Constitution in some way, even if I don't think it's uh, in the way that's that's valuable or that really conveys the the actual intention of those involved. Uh, however, you, of course, he, like many mainstream conservatives is very worried about the bottom line. It's the economy. It's about liberal economics in many ways. And I think you are probably right to some extent on that. Uh, Otario vids for $5. French is a dirty euphemist like GK Testerton talked about in eugenics and other evils. Yeah. Again, switching out the language so he doesn't have to acknowledge, uh, the actual consequences of what he's saying is really underhanded by French. It's really gross. Um, he uses the language of the left to make sure that he doesn't need to acknowledge what's actually being done in these scenarios. Uh, and I think that uh, saves him some moral culpability, he thinks, on his part. He doesn't, he doesn't have to face what's actually happening there. Uh, because if he said what's actually happening, if he faced the truth of the consequences of his stances, uh, then it might actually uh, be clear where the actual moral lies where, where morality actually lies on this uh, glow in the dark here for ten dollars french seems to be completely happy with the um uh with the obviously not grassroots co uh, completely astroturfed nature of this push french argues for uh kid love win love is love keep government out of relationships yeah again uh french is always willing to ignore 
the background, right? He, he's always willing to uh, just pretend like everything is happening on the surface. Everything is above the board. Uh, all these all these actions are being taken in the categories, the careful categories that he's constructed for his principal conservative stance. So everything happens in either the private sphere or the public sphere. Everything is either subject to the First Amendment or it's not. Uh, either you know the the only actors here are either government actors or private actors. He never acknowledges the crossover of the two. He never acknowledges the back and forth nature of the managerial state. Uh, the total state's willingness to cross these lines on a regular basis, to use uh, private institutions to circumvent uh, what what would theoretically be the restrictions of the Constitution. He's just never willing to acknowledge that. And so that means that over time, he's simply going to bend with the whim of whatever the left wants to do, right? He, like he said, he's going to go ahead and ignore uh, that these cultural uh, movements are pushed top down and not supported bottom up by the democracy that he again theoretically supports. Uh, let's see. Uh, Heath here for two dollars. French's ideology is just rationalized surrender. And yeah, I mean, I've, I used to tweet that out all the time that conservative is the ideology of surrender, right? And and, and you know, this is. The good news is, again, many people who who are culturally conservative are understanding this. They are shifting their views. They are realizing that this cultural detente that they were sold was a lie. And that's a very positive thing to be happening. It's it's a really good it's really good news that that's going on. But there is still this uh, this version of conservatives. There there's just always a percentage of people in every country around the world who are conservative. In their disposition but and by which they just mean they will just defend the institutions no matter what it doesn't matter if the institutions are taken over it doesn't matter if the institutions are subverted it doesn't matter uh if they've been completely corrupted from within and no longer do what they're supposed to do there's still this just these conservative uh white blood cells that are going to defend them no matter what has happened to them uh and this is this is french this is the man you know this is how it manifests in people like french where it doesn't matter how much the private public distinction has been destroyed french will still defend it as some kind of absolute uh that uh, means that the state has no ability to say for instance protect children or for instance to allow politicians to speak to their constituents so that the democratic process which is supposed to be the core of this whole system can move forward all right, Creeper Weirdo again for $5. Thank you very much. How does he walk with the fence posts where it is? Must be very painful. Yes, uh, the the eternal fence sitter and its consequences uh, would make it very uh, uncomfortable. Uh, let's see here. Glow in the dark for $5. Thank you again, sir. David French wants to protect the theoretical conservatives, theoretical citizens, theoretical rights. He protects abstractions. And yeah, that's really important. That's a really good point, right? Is he only he is only interested in this realm of theory that somewhere out there a theoretical right might be violated or that a uh, some kind of the precedent might be set. He's always ignoring the actual impact. What's actually happening to families? What's actually happening to children? How are people actually being impacted by his beliefs and his actions? What, what are the actual cultural consequences? You say you're protecting democracy and freedom of speech by uh, supporting the knockdown of a law in Florida that would, that would keep politicians from being banned. But what's the active thing that's happening there well actually less speech is happening speech is actually being denied uh po political opponents of the regime are being denied access to the avenues that would allow the democracy to function and so what's what's the actual thing the, the not the theoretical thing but the actual thing that's happening to the country again french isn't willing to address that uh let's see uh evan reese for five dollars thoughts uh you can share on glenn beck's interview with ron DeSantis if you aren't a fan of him running but he does have a shot against the dc swamp at potus so i've, I've seen pieces of that interview i've not seen the whole thing uh i will say i'll just go ahead and say what i've said a number of times on ron DeSantis. i'm a fan of ron DeSantis. i like ron DeSantis. I don't think that he's controlled opposition. Like there are a lot of people who say Ron DeSantis is is controlled opposition. He's just out there for establishment people to hold back Trump or something. I don't think that's true. I think Ron DeSantis uh, is 
uh, if he didn't hold all of these positions, which, you know, many politicians don't, I think he has changed some things in order to be more in line with kind of where the Republican party is going. But so did Trump to be really clear. Okay. Uh, Trump was a blue dog Democrat and he changed a number of his positions in order to kind of be in line, uh, with the Republican, uh, voter base. Right. Um, so he would not, DeSantis would not be the only one guilty of that, of that, if that was the case. So I like Ron DeSantis and I like what he's doing in Florida. I live in Florida. I benefit from Ron DeSantis' governorship and I'm a fan. That said, I don't think he should run for president because one, uh, I think he's doing a great job in Florida. I want selfishly to have him to continue to protect Florida and because he's showing Republican governors how this can get done. Guys like Greg Abbott are taking action based on what Ron DeSantis does. So he's doing a very valuable thing, which is providing a blueprint for how red state governors can resist the corruption of Washington, how they can push back on important issues and how they can assemble power bases outside of the swamp. I think that's incredibly valuable. I honestly think it's more valuable than marching into Washington and getting destroyed by the Washington machine, by getting bogged down by the deep state. I don't think that DeSantis is going to be able to reform DC in the way that he has attacked the problem of Florida because the regional power in Florida is very different than the installed power in DC. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he's going to walk in there and he's going to blow everything away and it's going to be amazing. I hope that's the case. That would be awesome. But I just don't think it is. And I think in the meantime, he's going to run straight into the buzzsaw of Trump. Now, a couple months ago, there's a stronger case for Trump because um, he was still, still seemed to have some of the wrecking ball ability against the media. In the time between here and there, Trump has shown he might, there, there might be the shine off the apple in a lot of ways. And of course, Trump wasn't perfect when he governed. So I was never in the impression that Trump was going to step back into office and fix all these problems. I don't think the election of either of these guys is going to solve our issue. Okay. And that's why I'm not really for DeSantis running for president this time around. Cause I don't think it's going to put him in a position to solve the issue. I do think it's going to blow his ability to kind of continue to shape the governor position and show how power can be exercised in a, le a regional level to, pr to protect people. And I think long-term he would be better served waiting this out and allowing a little more of this stuff to play out as he continues to form that position in Florida and then getting involved in it when there isn't this like head to head battle against Trump. But it seems very clear at this point that, you know, people have whispered in the ear of Ron DeSantis, you, you can be Caesar, uh, or you're, in this case, you can be president. And once that's been whispered in your ear, uh, it, for anybody, but particularly men of, of, of power and destiny, it's very hard to ignore. Uh, so I hope at the end of the day that if Ron DeSantis is elected, uh, I certainly would support him over Joe Biden or whoever the Democrats are going to throw in there. And I hope that he would be able to affect the changes that he's affected in Florida. That would be great. Though I would remind people that while the changes he's made in Florida are good, they're still insufficient. Okay. Uh, DeSantis still has only protected children up to fourth grade in Florida. Okay. And I'm very grateful that that action was taken. But remember that as much as the media, this is the thing, right? The media yells crazy, radical, blah, blah, blah. So that you think that that's as far as things can go. And so if they paint Ron DeSantis as the craziest right winger or Trump as the craziest right winger, then that's just as far as the Overton window can shift. But neither of these guys are particularly radical. None, neither of them are particularly uh, even, you know, DeSantis probably, I guess, a little more right wing in some ways than Trump was at the beginning. But neither of these guys are out there on the fringes. They're both, both very reasonable people when it comes to their policy positions, uh, you know, politically. Um, you know, maybe not Donald Trump rhetorically, but, but when it comes to actual policy implementation, very reasonable, probably too much. And so uh, when they're painted as radical, then we get to pretend that's the only as far as things go. But I don't think either of these guys are going to kind of clean up this thing. But if, if Ron DeSantis does get elected, I'll 100% be rooting for him to do so. I would certainly prefer him over Joe Biden uh, or anyone else the left would, would advance. Uh, glow in the dark for $5. Experts in ethics, especially medical ethics, are the most unethical and immoral people I have ever listened to. No wonder our medical systems 
suck. Yeah, absolutely. If someone describes themselves as an ethicist, uh, they are probably a complete sociopath. They are probably purely evil and you should probably uh, avoid them at all costs. Uh, it's almost always the uh, com complete disembodiment of ethics from any kind of moral tradition or substance that would matter. Uh, and it should almost always be ignored. Uh, glow in the dark again here for $10. Thank you very much, sir. DeSantis should secure Florida and coordinate with other state Republicans to secure those states. Then when it's done, go federal, secure the ground, then attack enemy territory. Yeah, that's 100% my position. That, that, that's exactly what I'm saying. Again, I'm not attacking uh, Trump or DeSantis. I think, think, think they both have valuable roles to play. I just think DeSantis' role would be best served as um, a governor for another term. Uh, many people disagree with that. That's fine. I totally understand their case. It's a reasonable case. I'm not saying anyone is ridiculous for wanting Ron DeSantis, wanting Ron DeSantis to run. And I'm not saying that Trump is in any way like a perfect candidate who, who would change everything. I don't think either of those is true. I think, uh, you know, Trump has already proven that he, he can't get in there and change everything, unfortunately. Uh, but I'm just saying that I don't think either of them would get in there and change everything. And I think DeSantis would be better served in Florida laying a roadmap for uh, the right. And I think Trump would be better served as a wrecking ball against the media. With that said, guys, we're going to go ahead and wrap things up. Thank you everybody for coming by. I had a great crowd, have lots of questions. Really appreciate you guys interacting. It's always great to see it come out. If this is your first time here, of course, please make sure that you go ahead and subscribe to the channel. If you want to go ahead and listen to these as podcasts, uh, these live streams, you can always go ahead and subscribe to the Orrin McIntyre, sorry, Orrin McIntyre podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. All the links to my different social medias and everything are down below. Make sure that you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Gab, all that stuff. If you want to watch these on Rumble or Odyssey, all the links are down there below as well. Thanks for coming by, guys. And as always, uh, let me see. Oh, sorry. Oh, I thought we had one more super chat there, but we're good. Okay. All right. So. Uh, thanks for coming by, guys. And as always, I will talk to you next time.